Does masonry have an even bigger secret? Well, uh, this is something that, of course, what I'm about to tell you is only known by probably one in 10,000 masons instead of one in 1,000 because it's part of the real nasty higher level things. But uh, this idea of resurrection that I mentioned earlier and eternal life and mortal life, well, deep within masonry it is taught that there's a kind of sexual vampirism that can go on. And, and, and this explains why you see the virtual epidemic of, of child sexual abuse among Masons is they believe, and this is also commonly held among Illumin Illuminists, that if you have sex with a child that you, you steal some of their youth and that that in turn makes you live longer. And so if you have lots of sex with lots of little children, the younger the better, you can live virtually forever. And this is the promise that's held out by Masons. I know it, it sounds appalling and disgusting, but uh, both in, and you've got to realize that at the highest levels, it's kind of like a pyramid of luminism and masonry just sort of blend together. But at that level, you're talking about a very high level of demonic possession. It's fortunately not a level I ever got to. I was pulled out of it by the Lord before that happened. But um, it is a level where, you know, people are, are so demon possessed, the term that we use is they're perfectly possessed which means like they're, you know, basically every cubic centimeter of their body is full of demons and there's nobody else home. And these people uh, are so enslaved by the demonic realm that they'll do anything, including, you know, murder children, attack infants, you know, do whatever they can to keep what they believe to be their mortality going. So, it's, so when you hear Masonry talk about, oh, we believe in the immortality of the soul, well and also the hope of a resurrection. It's not the resurrection that Christians talk about. Wow. Well, I, I guess that answers my next question, which is um, most people think that Freemasons are just nice people to help out at charity. So what would you say to that? But like well, you're saying that's only very that's, few yeah, of them. It's a tiny percentage. I mean, the vast majority of Masons that you see are, are just nice guys that are spiritual idiots. I mean, I hate to say that, but they don't know what they're into. They've... They, if, if indeed they're, they are professing Christians, which some of them are, some of them aren't, because Masonry accepts anyone. I mean, you're, when you're a Mason, see, that's one of our issues with it. You are in fellowship with, with uh, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, witches, even Satan worshippers. You're yoked to them. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6 that we're not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has light with darkness? What fellowship has Christ with Belial? Etc. Etc. So uh, that's a real issue. But um, no, um, while Masons are, they're, they're deceived. The vast majority of them are just deceived people who think they're in a nice organization. Yeah, there's no denying that Masonry does some good. They, they have charities. Every branch of Masonry has its own 
special cherry, like, oddly enough, the Scottish Rite, which is one of the more evil branches of Masonry, has a schizophrenia foundation where they give money to help people with schizophrenics, and so on and so on. So, you know, they do good, but, I mean, so does the Mafia. I mean, the Mafia built most of the Catholic hospitals in America. Oh. Does that mean you want to join the Mafia? No. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> Thank you. Is it a religion? Well, that's, again, a controversial question, because, of course, they claim they're not. They say, we're a religious organization, but we're not a religion. And to me, that's just plain word games, you know. I mean, if you look at Webster's Dictionary, which is an objective source, you know, it says that a religion, first of all, expresses a belief, or has a, requires a belief in some sort of deity. Masonry does that. Secondly, that that a religion expresses that kind of belief in ritual and liturgy. And Masonry is very ritualized, as we've already discussed. And thirdly, it says a religion has a code of conduct or ethics by which the religion members must live. And Masonry has that. So Masonry has all the qualities of a religion, according to Webster. And I tell people, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any connections between Freemasonry and Catholicism? Well, of course, on the surface, as we talked earlier, they appear to be separate. Uh, in fact, even oppositional to one another, because Masonry is basically universalist, which means they believe everybody is going to go to heaven. They think everybody's going to go to the, the, what they call the celestial lodge above. Whereas Catholicism is just the opposite. Catholicism teaches extra ecclesia nullus salus est. You know, outside of the church there is no salvation. So, in the surface, it appears as though they're separate. But actually, in the early days, um, who do you think built all the cathedrals of the Catholic Church? The Freemasons. And it may surprise, and I, I think we may even covered this, but uh, to some of your viewers to learn that, that the Jesuits wrote a lot of the degrees of the Scottish Rite, which is actually the most anti-Catholic system of degree work in the United States. That's weird. Yes, it is. But you see, this is how, at the highest level, the luminous mindset thinks. So, yeah, actually there are some connections. I think we already explored the fact that many of the recent popes have been Masons. A lot of the cardinals have been Masons. Even when I was in Milwaukee and I was involved with the old Roman Catholic Church, the cardinal there, or the archbishop, I'm sorry, Cousins was his name, Archbishop Cousins, uh, he actually would go and praise the Masons and he would speak at a, she actually spoke at a shrine dinner that I attended and said how wonderful the Masons were. And this is all because, as I mentioned earlier, John Paul II had lifted the ban on Catholics being Masons. Right. Are any of the symbols or any of those kind of things similar? Well, of course, um, like the symbol of, this, of, the, of the York Rite Commandery is a cross, like kind of, sideways sliding through a crown. And that's, that's a common symbol in, in not only the Catholic Church, but other churches. Uh, and of course, the funny thing is, is guess what you find right at the heart of Vatican City in front of St. Peter's Basilica, a Masonic obelisk, hmm. Cleopatra's Needle. And when it was brought there from Egypt, and, and it, this is the funny thing, because the, the sacred, the most sacred thing that Masons will talk about is the, the idea of the point within the circle, which is basically a um, kind of a, a glyph, if you will, a secret symbol of the, of the female is the, is the um, circle, and the point within the center of the circle is the male. So again, we're back to sexual symbols. And if you look at Vatican City, the St. Peter's Basilica from the air, you've got, you've got the basilica, you've got like, there's two great big things that come down, more or less like a circle, and right smack dab in the center of that circle is Cleopatra's needle. All right. And see, that was designed like five or six hundred years ago, well, no more than that even. It was designed partially by um, Michelangelo, in fact. So that's, you know, probably seven or eight hundred years old. So the connection goes back a long ways. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any connections between Freemasonry and Mormonism? Well, you might say that. Of course, obviously, Masonry is older because the Mormon Church was only started in 1830. And Joseph Smith was a Freemason. Uh, so was his brother Hiram. So was Brigham Young. So I think the first four or five prophets of the Mormon Church were Freemasons. And 
not only that, if you, if you look at the history of the church, this is actually an official church book written by Joseph Smith. He talks about how he was raised to the sublime degree. Now that's Masonic double talk for meaning he was made a Master Mason. And that means he got all the basic secrets, if you will, of masonry. And guess what? Just a few weeks later, this is, he doesn't make the connection, of course, in the book. He says that God revealed to him the secret temple endowment of the LDS Church, which is these, you see these temples in most large cities now have, have um, I don't know where the nearest one is down here in Florida. You might have one in Orlando or something. But anyway, these temples are places where no non-Mormon can go and only a handful of Mormons can go. And inside of them they do rituals that they believe will ensure them eternal life and Godhead. Now, Godhood. Now, the funny thing is, is all those rituals are about 80% Masonic. They're virtually identical to the Masonic rituals, right down to the secret handshakes, right down to some of the ritual gestures, so on and so on. So there's a profound connection between um, Mormonism and Freemasonry. You might as well say that Masonry was the crucible, partially, from which Mormonism was created. Thank you. Do they have any similar symbols or anything? Oh, well, yes, yes. They have, uh, first of all, if you look at the temple, the, all the older temples, the Salt Lake Temple, the St. George Temple, and the Nauvoo Temple, which no longer is in existence, they're rebuilding it, I think they may have already done that, all have Masonic symbols all over them. The all-seeing eye, they have the secret handshakes. These are actually like, you know, bas-relief engraved in the stone. They have uh, the inverted pentagrams. They have the uh, virtually every Masonic symbol you'll find, except the square and compass on those temples. Where you'll find the square and compass is on the sacred underwear of the Mormon, the Temple Mormon. Temple Mormons wear, we call them the magic undies, or the funny undies. And their their special underwear that's supposed to protect them from harm, and they're never supposed to really let people see them. But if you ever get your hands on a pair, I used to wear them, so I know they have a Masonic square on one breast, a Masonic compass stitched into the other breast. These are just like stitches; they're not like in a different color or anything. They're white, so they look like you know a T-shirt. Then they go down to your knees. So it kind of looks like an old-fashioned bathing suit from the 1920s. They come down to here, come down to here. They used to be one piece. Now they're, they can buy them either way. And on the knee is a Masonic gauge. So actually there's Masonic marking. Oh, and there's a Masonic gauge over the navel, too. Forgot that. So yeah, right even in their most sacred underwear, they have these Masonic markings. Thank you. Are there any connections between Freemasonry and New Age teachings? Well, that's the funny thing, because the Scottish Rite had this very prestigious magazine for many years, and guess what it was called? The New Age. It only in the last maybe 15, 10, 15 years, they changed the name to the Scottish Rite Journal at Norman Vincent Peale's suggestion, because he said, oh, people are starting to think that Masons are part of the New Age. Well, you might as well say Masonry is proto-New Age. I mean, it was... It was New Age before the New Age movement was even a gleam in, you know, like Jay-Z Knight's eye or whatever. I mean, it was almost all the same concepts, except more subtly taught. Like, for example, basically the New Age teaches universalism, that eventually everybody will get to heaven, you know, or whatever they think the afterlife is. Uh, so does Masonry. The New Age basically teaches that all religions are equally good. So does the New Age. Um, and of course, a lot of New Age groups are very much into initiations, into the idea of, you know, either you go and some guru puts his thumb on your forehead and, you know, gives you some awesome zap of energy, or you go through some secret rite or whatever the case might be. And of course, initiations is the core of Freemasonry. So there's a very strong connection between Masonry and the New Age movement. Okay, thank you. One other thing that just came yeah. to my mind. Um, most people agree that kind of the... Um, the grandmother, if you will, of the entire New Age movement was the Theosophical Society and Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky. And a lot of people don't realize that she and all of her cohorts were Masons. But she, were, she was a woman, so... Well, there's some question about that. Really? Oh, you're kidding. <laughs> she used to, she, no, she, used to, she claimed that she had no vagina. In her writing, she claimed that she. Really? So obviously, she wow. was a woman, but I mean, genetically, she was a woman. But she claimed that's why she never had children. 
she married some Russian count so she could become a a madam, you know. But uh, she she never had children, and, and she was, of course, a very mannish-looking woman. Yes. Not not someone you'd really want to snuggle up to. But anyhow, uh, what what you've got to understand is that there are in Europe, and we were involved in this too. There are in Europe branches of masonry called le droit humain, which in French means human rights. And this is a lodge that was started in the 1800s, and it was the first lodge to admit women. Now, le droit humain in English is known as co-masonry because it's co-ed, and both men and women can be members, and it was more or less taken over under the umbrella of the Theosophical Society. So that's why you'll see, for example, a lot of the leading, even the female uh, figures like Blavatsky of Theosophy, they'll have after their names, 33rd degree, illustrious, you know, blah, blah, blah. And um, so in that sense, there's a very strong connection. Oh, wow, thank you. Mm -hmm. Didn't know that. <laughs> well, we, we see articles about Freemasons and their funding at children's hospitals. Are they trying to help people or is something else going on here? Well, I, I don't doubt that most of the guys involved in that uh, do are trying to help people. I, I mean, I think mainly you're thinking of the Shriners there because the Shriners have these hospitals for crippled children and these burn centers. And, and yeah, they do a lot of good work. And I think most of the men involved are, are doing it for very noble reasons. But we have had, and this is all they are, is allegations by parents that many times we've been told that their kids have been taken, you know, had been in those hospitals for altruistic reasons, but then that they were sexually molested by the personnel in the hospital. So I just, I just would personally caution Apparently, we've had many people write us over the years and heart goes, oh, my kid has whatever disease, you know, and we can't afford insurance, and this friend is saying they'll do it for free. And should we take our kid to that hospital? I just, I just kind of, with a breaking heart, I'd say if it was my kid, I would not. How about how many counts have you run across of things like that? Oh, at least eight or ten, I wow. think, over the years. And, you know, you could say, well, these people are wackos or they're embittered in some way, but... But, you know, where there's smoke, there's usually fire. And knowing what we know from earlier discussion, that there's this, this spirit within a mason that just rises up and makes them want to abuse children, it's, it's like an obsession. It's a spirit of bondage. In the later rites. Yes, yeah, yeah in the higher rites. And uh, even, even a regular old third-degree master mason, I'm not saying they go through these things, mm -hmm. But the spirit is could, still there. Because they're all joined to and the, the Yeah, they're all joined together, and the spirit will still work on them and corrode their sense of morality. And so, you know, it's, it's certainly, I think it's at least possible. And that's why we just feel you, you shouldn't really take, you know, free gifts from the devil. And that's because if you understood the shrine, especially in this day and age, the shrine is basically an organization that glorifies Islam. The... It's called the Ancient and Arabic Order of the Nobles of the Mystic Shrine. So why would Americans join a group like that? Well, for, you got to realize this has been around for many years, uh -huh. it, it, long before terrorists or 9-11 or right. anything like that. But, but because it was fun, because it was kind of, you see, you get to dress up in these funny costumes, you know, like wear the burnous and the fancy silk jammies and wave scimitars around and you get to, like, and I'm sure, I, mean, I, I know you're not from America originally, but, you know, if you, in most American cities, like on the 4th of July, you'll see Shriners driving their little cars or their motor scooters. They have little motor scooters they ride, or else they have camels that they ride. And, and it's, it's great. They have an oriental band. Large shrines have, because um, there's a shrine center in almost every major city, have like um, piper bands and stuff. There's lots of activities you can join in. And plus, see Shriners, are you ready for this? Shriners are allowed to drink camel's milk. <laughs> Yuck. No, you know what it really is? It's beer. Ah. Okay. <laughs> you, see, oh, you can't drink beer or alcohol in any other Masonic institution in America. That would make a big difference. That would make a big difference. Right. So they're actually allowed to have beer. In any, if you walk into these shrine temples, they're gorgeous. Like the one in Milwaukee that I was a part of, which I think was, um, El, I think it was El Cahir, um, looks like the Taj Mahal outside. Big thing. I mean, you know, like 
the two or three stories high, big minarets, big bulbous, you know, whatever they call those domes and everything. Beautiful inside. I mean, you think you're inside of a mansion, and you see shrine is very expensive to join. And, of course, they say, oh, well, all that money goes to the crippled children. Well, no, it doesn't. Ninety-five percent of it doesn't. Where does it go? It goes to the shrine. And who spends it? Well, if you could see the jewelry that a shrine potentate gets when he becomes a shrine uh, potentate, which is like the head of the local shrine body, it costs a couple thousand bucks minimum hmm. just for this, this hunk of jewelry they wear around their neck. They get all these rings and jewels and, I mean, you know, it's, it's not a, it, you see, you got to realize, in, if you have a 501c3 corporation in this country, you're allowed to spend up to 95% of the money you get in on administrative costs and then only give 5% to charity. Mm -hmm. And they take advantage of that fully. The, in fact, it was the Orlando, is it the Orlando Sentinel? or the Orlando Sun, I forget which. Anyway, the Orlando newspaper about 10 or 12 years ago actually did an expose of how little money the shrine actually takes in and then gives to their charities. Because they have shrine circuses, they have shrine this, they have shrine that, you know, lots of fundraising. Anyhow, I was talking about this Islamic component. When you go in, you're made to swear your oath that I talked about earlier, this blood-curdling oath on the Quran instead of on the Bible. Mm. And you swear this oath, and then you end up by saying, I swear this oath in the name of Allah, the God of my forefathers, the God of the Muslim and the Mohammedan and the Din. Wow. And of course, 99% of the people, because the shrine is a uniquely American body, I don't think there's any shriners outside of the United States. And probably 99% of them are not Muslims. Right. They're probably, you know, Protestants or agnostics or atheists or whatever. Well, not atheists because they can't be a shriner if they're an atheist. But, you know, so this is really blasphemous. And then you, you, the, the oath is that if you break the oath, your eyes will be pierced with red-hot three-cornered daggers. Why three-cornered daggers, you might ask? Because that way the wound will never close. Hmm. Nice stuff. Horrible, huh? horrible. And if we had the time, I might tell you what the shrine initiation involves. What's that? Okay, well, <laughs> you have, first of all, it's so arduous, you have to go through a physical before you go through it. They have shriner doctors, MDs, that will give you a physical, make sure your heart is good, make sure you have no pre existing health conditions. And then it's basically like a super expensive super atrocious version of a college fraternity hazing. Like in, in my case, first of all, I had to walk across the burn, they strip you down to your underwear. Then you have to walk across the, you're supposed to be a pilgrim on your way to the shrine, you see. And you have to walk across the burning sands of the desert. So what they do, they lay down this, this, this special carpeting and it's got electrical things running through it. Ooh. So that as you walk on it, you get electrical shocks. Ooh. And it's like, I don't know how many volts it is, but it, it hurts. It really hurts. And then they have the infamous bunghole test, where you're put inside of a barrel with a hole in it, and they make you think they squirt warm water on you to make you think a dog is peeing on you. And then the other thing they did in, in our case, because this varies a little bit from time to time, and they say there's this whole audience full of Shriners watching this, because you're blindfolded. Oh. And so they're out there laughing, just having a wonderful old time, you know, and you're being humiliated. And so I was up there on my knee, on my hands and knees, blindfolded, and they dangled a uh, frankfurter in front of us on a string, which would bob around, you know, like that. And you're supposed to try and eat this frankfurter blindfolded while they're sticking you in the rear end with hat pins. Oh. So doesn't this job very, sound special? Not very dignified. <laughs> well, no, no, not at all. And um, so between that and between the high level, because all the shrine officers are dressed as Muslim potentates, and the shriners all wear this fez, which you've probably seen, this purple, kind of reddish-purple conical hat. And that, of course, comes from the city of Fez in Morocco. And a popular, I don't know if this is true, but a popular Muslim legend says, that, you know how that hat originated? Way back when Islam was first spreading across um, North Africa through jihad, which is holy war, the 
Muslims came to the city of Fez, which was all Christian. And they basically, they basically said, you must convert to Islam or we'll kill you. And they said, we'll never deny our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so they fought the war, they broke into the city, and they basically slaughtered all the Christians in the city. They beheaded them. That's the Muslim idea of soul winning. It's convert to Islam or we'll cut off your head. That's why the symbol of the shrine is a scimitar. A scimitar is that unique kind of curvy Islamic uh, sword. And then the other symbol on the shrine that you'll see all over the place is like, it's kind of like a head of a sphinx. You know, like the head of an Egyptian, you know, with a funny headdress and all. So that's what you'll see like on all the different um, shrine gear is that. And so the streets were literally running with the blood of these Christian martyrs. And to celebrate, the uh, Muslim invaders took off their turbans and dipped them in the blood of the Christian martyrs and put them back on their heads. And that's why the, the fez has that odd color that looks like dried blood. So how many Shriners know that? Probably virtually none of them. Okay. And how I you sure didn't when I was in it. Well, I was told that by a, by a Muslim who got saved. And he, he, he was a man who converted to Islam uh, while in North Africa. He was actually stationed in Morocco, which is where the city of Fez is. So he probably would know. Right. But of course, the Shriners will deny this. I see. But, you know, can you imagine being a Christian and wearing that hat no, thank and you. swearing an oath on the Quran, which is, of course, the holy book of Islam? Well, you wouldn't want to be anyone, really, with a hat like that. No, no. Plus, they look really silly. <laughs> <laughs> Please explain what mega, megapolis somancy is. Megapolis somancy. <laughs> yeah, well, that's one of those big words. And uh, basically, it is something that is taught in the most esoteric high levels of masonry. And it's the idea, it literally means, megapolis means big city, like some people may have even heard like New York being called a megapolis. And omensi means magic of. So it's literally the magic of big cities. And it's the idea that through architecture, you can enhance the spiritual vibrations of a city or of a building. And there's certain things that, because you know, Masons are basically temple builders. Uh, they claim that, that long before there were the Christian cathedrals, that Masons built the Parthenon, that Masons built the, um, the great you know, temples of Rome, and uh, the, the, then they were called the Dionysian artificers, but it was basically the same thing. And even in Egypt, Masons built like the great pyramid of Khufu and, and the great temples of Luxor and Karnak. Anyhow, the, well, the key principle that we were taught is if you really want to create an atmosphere in a room or in a building for the manifestation of evil spirits, gee, isn't this fun? Mm. Anyway, you want to make the building somewhat trapezoidal in shape. And of course, a trapezoid is like a pyramid with the top lopped off. And if you think about it, you see all these ancient pictures of these temples in Egypt, they all are trapezoidal shaped. They're all larger at the bottom than they are at the top. And, and so basically, in a nutshell, Megapolis Solvency is the science of creating buildings that will enable you to do effective black magic. And this is why, for example, we were taught when we were in, in all of this stuff that, that for example, haunted houses are very frequently have mansard roofs which like the Adams family house that's kind of a classic haunted house where they have roofs that kind of go like this and then they're flat see that's a trapezoid and every haunted house we dealt with when we were um, ghostbusters so to speak 10 years before the movie came out they all had something in the house where the angles were out of true where instead of right angles they were just one or two degrees off and then you have a trapezoid. Mm. The most, I mean, obviously the most famous trapezoid in the world is the um, John Hancock Tower, I think it is, in Chicago, which is this giant black trapezoid. It's like one of the fourth or fifth tallest buildings in the world. And on top are the twin horns of Lucifer. They're like two, mm. you know, yeah. like TV towers or radio towers or whatever. And when that building first went up, it had the highest suicide rate, highest mental breakdown rate of any of any building in America for its comparable size. 
Thank you. I've seen maps, drawings that show that there are Masonic symbols in Washington. Is that also part of Megalopolis of mine? Megalopolis of mine, yes. <laughs> yes, it exactly was the layout of streets. In fact, uh, Ed Decker and I are the ones that first came up with that little discovery. Really? That you, uh, way back in the, in the late uh, 80s, that if you lay out a street map, first of all, the entire city of Washington, D.C. is laid out like a giant rhombus. You break that down, and there's, there's four Masonic cornerstones at the north, at the south, at the east, and the west of Washington, D.C. Giant stones set in the earth. And then if you go into the city and break it down further, you will find that, for example, there's squares, there's compasses, there's a giant inverted pentagram pointed straight at the White House. And, of course, an inverted pentagram is a symbol of Satan. It's a symbol that Satan is used to draw down the kingdom of Satan and manifestation on the earth. And then you wonder why our president has problems. Oh, I guess that answers the next question. How does that affect us as a society? Well, see, for many years, Masonry's influence is waning. But for many years, Masonry is kind of like the civil religion of America because it was, it was so universalist that most people wouldn't squawk about it. And, and men, in most cities, the, uh, the city halls, the courthouses, et cetera, et cetera, are, were all dedicated by Freemasons. They'd invite the local master of the lodge to lay the cornerstone, et cetera, et cetera. And what does that mean? That means that the cities are all under a curse. So does the, that the, mean we need to tear them all down and build new well, ones today? Well, at the very least, it means you need to go and pray over those things and, and destroy them. I mean, if spiritually destroy the strongholds that are that are in them. And in fact, that's very much like what we did back in 1990. Uh, I and about a dozen other ministers to Masons joined forces with Intercessors for America. And um, we went to Washington, D.C. We marched from the White House, 13 blocks, isn't that interesting? 13 blocks from the White House, I think it's south, to the House of the Temple, which is the supreme headquarters of the Scottish Rite, the Supreme Council of Grand Sovereign Inspectors General. And we went there and we prayed over it, we anointed it with oil, we cast down the strongholds of masonry in this country, and really, you know, this is all Yahweh's doing, it's not our doing, but since that time, masonry has started to unravel in this nation. I mean, even the, the Southern Baptist Convention actually it kind of didn't go as far as it should have, but they actually did a report and acknowledged that masonry had problems in terms of being compatible with Christianity. So um, since then, I mean, I remember, I personally, if you go to that building, it's creepy looking in D.C., and there's these two giant sphinxes out in front of it, big stone sphinxes. And I personally went up and with holy oil, I anointed both of them in the name of Yeshua and prayed over them. And we anointed the dwarf. And it was so funny, we were all there um, just praying up a storm, you know, and there's this old guy that lives in the place. It's like a caretaker. And the lead guy from Intercessions for America was this lovely little black gentleman. It was about, you know, like five foot four, you know. And he was standing there praying in tongues, you know. And this guy opened the door, and here's this little black guy going, you know, something like that. And the guy just went, like that, and, you know, shut the door. He wasn't going to mess with us. And, and I think really that was a great moment in the history of the, if you want to call it, anti-Masonic movement in this country because we, we went right to the pinnacle of the, of the stronghold and the strong man of Mason in this nation and we prayed against it and we cut it off at the kneecaps. And since that time, Masonry's influence has really been declining. There, at that time, there were around four million Masons in America. Now there's two and a half million. Great. So and the internet's making further inroads. Oh yeah, you say? yeah. Just because, just because more and more people are learning the truth through the internet. Yeah. Would it make a difference that the physical buildings and everything are still remaining? Oh, but it would make a little difference. But you see, if you go there and in effect you reconsecrate that land and that building, of course you probably have to do it after dark. Uh, to Yahweh Almighty, mm -hmm. that would make a big difference. Okay. Because his power is so much greater than the power of the adversary. Right. Uh, and, and, I mean, of course, legally you don't own the building, so, so there's still, the, the, the devil still has a right to mess around in there, but it's going to vastly diminish the influence the building has on the larger, larger community. Good. In fact, you mentioned this layout of, there's many, especially 
in the east and in the south, there's many state capitals that are also laid out by Masons. Okay, thank you. I don't know if like Tallahassee is, but I know a lot of the, the eastern cities that were part of the original 13 colonies were laid out in a Masonic format. Mm, thank you. You said earlier that the skull and bone society is worse than Freemasonry. What, in what way? Well, it's, its initiations are more overtly bizarre, if that were possible, and its influence is so much greater. It's very elite, too. I mean, virtually any bozo can become a Mason. Uh, whereas you have to be the elite of the elite. Of course, you have to be a Yale um, student beyond that. But uh, really, only the only the the mossy money families, the really rich families, the powerful, like say, for example, the Bush family, uh, would be allowed to get into that. And how do you know that the rituals are worked? Uh, well, because they they have been partially at least revealed. Uh, some guy went in there with a spy camera. And actually, and plus, some of them have very, you know, some of them that have talked over the years. And it involves basically laying naked in a coffin with a uh, red string around your male member and reciting all of your sexual encounters to all your fellow bonesmen. And that's the best part of it. Ooh, yeah. So, you know, and of course, there's all sorts of weird claims about this, that there's a skull or skulls in the, they call it, I think they call it, the temple. It's, it's this big old building on the Yale campus and there's everything I've heard everything from that it's the skull of Geronimo to that it's the skull of Adam. You know, and I mean, how you would know it's the skull of Adam right. beyond me, but uh, it, it, and it's a very anti-Christian group. I mean, some of the ethics that are taught and the, the if you will, the, the morality that's taught within the group are, are very anti-Christ. And of course, then you look at the fact that in, in virtually every administration, uh, every Congress, there's like dozens of bonesmen. I mean, both the guys that ran for president in the last election were bonesmen. You know, Kerry was a bonesman and so was Bush. Okay, thank you. Yeah. What's the definition of Catholicism? Well, of course, Catholicism literally means universal. That's the actual meaning of the word. The, when you say the Catholic Church, you mean the universal church. But what most people mean when they say Catholic or Catholicism, they mean the Roman Catholic Church, which has its headquarters in the Vatican. So, you know, we'll keep it at that for, for the purposes of our discussion. Um, the Catholic Church is, I think, the world's oldest and largest and most powerful cult. They are not a Christian religion, even though they claim to be. And essentially... They have over a billion people who they have deceived into a false system of, of weird anti-biblical works that, that, I mean, we could just literally talk for hours about. But, but essentially, I think it, it, is, it is, of course, the world's largest supposedly Christian religion. But yet, on the other hand, its teachings are often quite contrary to the gospel. Okay, so what makes you say it's not a Christian religion? Well, they've got one thing right. They're, you know, they they obvious, they confess that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, is God, which is great. And I'm not saying there aren't many Catholics that aren't saved, genuinely born again, but they're saved in spite of the church rather than because of the church. Uh, but other than that, we're in trouble doctrinally. They don't believe that the Bible is the sole source of truth. They say they have the magisterial teaching authority of the church and the Bible together. And see, they have an old saying in the South, a two-headed dog won't hunt. And if you've got the Bible going one way and the magisterial authority of the church going another way, as often as the case, what happens? Well, you can bet the magisterial authority of the church wins. For example, the Torah, the Old Testament says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. That's right in the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue. And yet, what did the Catholic Church do? Every Catholic church has all these statues to Mary, St. Joseph. They have a dead corpus of Jesus hanging on the cross, and they have statues of St. Jude, St. Francis, you know, saints all over the place. And they pray to these statues. They believe, mind you, these statues are a focus for which they can go through them and, and actually reach the real spiritual entity that's, so to speak, behind the statues. But they're, they're committing idolatry. Not only that, they worship a cookie. 
I mean, they have this, this communion wafer, and they believe that communion wafer is God, literally. And they worship it. I mean, if you've ever, like, you know, now we have an opportunity to see some of this stuff that we didn't use to because they have their own huge cable TV network, EWTN, and you can see they, they have this thing called the Benediction of the Blessed Sacrament where they, where they enthrone this, this host, which is a little cookie of bread, in this really elaborate monstrance, it's called, or Austin soaring with sunbursts around it and gold and angels flying around it and everything. And, and they put it up there and they all worship it. And they even will kneel before it, and instead of genuflecting on one knee, they'll genuflect on both knees and bow very deeply because they believe they are literally in the presence of Almighty God, you know. And then the priest will take it and he will hold it and he will bless the whole congregation with it like he's, you know, zapping them with this giant, you know, searchlight of sanctity, you know. And I mean, that's 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 idolatry. You're worshiping the creature instead of the creator, which is you know it, it's a piece of bread for heaven's sakes. So so that's just a couple of examples. I mean, then the other problem, which is really the worst problem, is that the the Catholic Church denies that you're saved by grace through faith. Ephesians two eight and nine. They say that you can. In fact, one of the popes. I can't give you the name offhand, but he, I think it was maybe even Pius, St. Pius V, he taught that if anyone says that you are saved by grace alone and faith without having to do good works, you are under a curse. Ooh. Anathema sit, in, the, in the, the way they say it in their Latin. Although anathema is actually a Greek word, but you know, who's quibbling. So, so they will teach Catholics, okay, yeah, you get sprinkled as a baby, and then you um, go along, you get confirmed at a certain age, and then basically you have to do all these other things. You have to go to Mass, you have to take communion, you have to go to confession at least once a year, you have to do all of these other things. And no Catholic knows for sure if they're going to go to heaven or not, right up to the moment of their death. Like when, when this Pope who recently died, John Paul II, at the, even at the moment of his death, he had to have a priest there absolving him and giving him the last rites, and, and he had to confess his sins because he didn't know if he was going to go to heaven or not. No, no, that's the sad thing. And because, you know, it talks in First John, these things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. See, as a Christian believer, I know that I have eternal life. But uh, if you, in fact, there's this one excellent video, I'm giving someone else a plug here, but it's called Catholicism in Crisis, where they went and talked to like about two dozen Catholics outside of St. Patrick's Cathedral one morning after Sunday Mass. And they asked them, do you think you're going to heaven? And most of them said they hoped they would. And then they asked them why. And they all said, well, because I'm more or less a good person or because I go to Mass on Sunday or because I, I, I do more good stuff than I do bad stuff you know, which is basically the doctrine of Islam. And, uh, and none of them said because of Yeshua, because of Jesus and what he did on the cross. So that's the biggest issue right there. And then, of course, there's, there's all these secondary things, like even the, the status of the Pope, that, you know, they believe that he's the supreme bishop of the universal church. And, and so every other Christian ultimately has to bow the knee to him or they're going to go to hell. Okay, thank you. Well, I think a lot of people, Catholics and not Catholics, get Catholicism and Christianity mixed up. Well, that's so intentional, yeah. I just want to know, what. give us a definition of Christianity. Well, Christianity is the faith once delivered unto the saints, I mean, in the primitive Christian church. And it, it's basically the teachings of the New Testament and nothing else. Nothing added, nothing subtracted, the teachings of the Bible. And so the big difference, which, which lays down a line of demarcation between Christianity and every other religion, including cults like Mormonism and Catholicism and Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever, is that Christianity says your, your salvation is through faith in what Yeshua did for us on the cross. That's it. That is what saves you. And that you don't need to do all this other stuff in order to be saved. That's the big difference. That's the line of demarcation. And, of course, you're, that doesn't mean that you just get born again and then want to live like the devil. 
you know, and most Christian preachers and teachers worth their soul will say, then you, you are saved to do good works, to keep the commandments, etc., etc. You're not supposed to go out and whore around and drink and gamble and whatever, you know, smoke, chew, or go with girls that do. You know, you're supposed to live a good, godly life according to the commandments. So, uh, but, but that isn't what saves you. That's just a consequence of what saves you. And the other key thing about Christianity is that it teaches that when you get born again, the Holy Spirit comes and writes the laws of Yahweh God on your heart. And I heard one preacher say it this way. It's the difference between, like if you're driving down the road and you're speeding, you know, that's like an unsaved person. A saved person is like someone driving down the road and they have a state trooper sitting next to them in a car. They're not going to be as likely to speed, are they? And see, when you're a believer, you have Yahweh God, the almighty creator of the universe, living in you. That's a big difference. Okay. Thank you. How did you become a Catholic priest? Well, I see, I wanted to be a Catholic priest from the time I was old enough to know what it was. I was raised Catholic, as I think I've already said, and and even as a little kid, five or six years old, I would cut up my mother's bed sheets and color them and make vestments out of them, and I'd pretend to say the Mass with a, with a, I got a martini glass for a chalice, you know. And, and so I, you know, I went to minor seminary, Catholic grade school, Catholic high school, Catholic college, and of course I've already said, while I was in the seminary, minor seminary, I got turned aside by these professors that were telling me I had to be a witch, that I had to be an occultist. So once I became a witch, I became a witch high priest, a funny thing happened to me. I went to see one of the most god-awful movies that's ever been made, The Exorcist. I went to see that movie with my wife and some other witch high priests. It was the funniest thing, because we were all witch high priests. We were some of the leading Wiccan leaders in Chicago and us went to see this movie. And it scared the living daylights out of me. I had nightmares from that movie. And it kind of scared me into wanting to get back into the Catholic Church. And I also wanted to be a witch, and of course I was married. That was a problem, because the Catholic priests aren't allowed to be married. So as, as <laughs> luck would have it, remember the root of the word luck is Lucifer. Really? Yes. yes. So when you say good luck to somebody, watch it. Ooh. There is no luck in the kingdom of heaven. It's all divine providence. So anyhow, as luck would have it, uh, when we moved to Milwaukee, as I've said earlier, we were setting up all these covens and everything, uh, a priest from the old Roman Catholic Church came to this guy who ran this occult bookstore and said he had heard that he was having someone in town who was, who was teaching people witchcraft and could he come into classes. And so we met and we worked out an arrangement whereby this fellow, now the old Roman rite is a, a kind of a splinter group from about 300 years ago in the church of Utrecht in Holland where they were broken off because of the political intrigue surrounding the Protestant Reformation. And there were no bishops left in the diocese of Utrecht. And see, in Catholic canon law, the church in, a, in an area can't exist without a bishop because it is from the bishop that the priests derive their ordinary power. So, as it happens, and this sounds like some weird story, but as it happens, the Archbishop of Babylon was traveling incognito through Holland, and he found out what was going on. And so, he told the, the priests in the, in the Diocese of Utrecht, we'll get together and vote on three men, and I will lay hands on them and consecrate them a bishop. And so they did that. Now this is the first time that we know of in the history of the Roman Catholic Church that someone was consecrated a bishop without the Pope's express permission. When the Jesuits found out about it, they were livid. And they cut off Holland from the outside, just like the Protestant Dutch had cut it off from the inside. And so for like 250 years, this Church of Utrecht existed kind of like in the land that time forgot. They were invited to the First Vatican Council. They, they were? Or they they were, weren't, weren't invited. Right, right. And so they do not accept the doctrines that were promulgated there, like the Immaculate Conception and the Infallibility of the Pope. And they also do not, do not require the clergy to be celibate. You're allowed to be a married priest. 
But otherwise, their holy orders, the sacrament of holy orders, is completely valid. How did that work? Because Catholic priests have never been able to marry, have they? No, no, no. It's, the, the, the stricture against marriage only was made formal in the year, around the year 1000. Oh. For the first thousand years of church history, uh, Catholic priests were allowed to marry. And to this day, Uniate Catholic priests are allowed to marry. Uh, Orthodox priests are allowed to marry, you know, Greek Orthodox, mm -hmm. Russian Orthodox, so on. But uh, but actually, that's only been in the last thousand years. Um, so anyway, we were, uh, and because this was a separate jurisdiction, and this guy was a priest in the old Catholic Church. And so he arranged me to start studying and meet with uh, bishops in the old Catholic Church, Finally, in 1976, I think it was, I was ordained to the priesthood, and uh, that was in Joliet, Illinois. And then I was made the associate pastor of Our Lady of Perpetual Help Friary in Milwaukee, and I was there for several years. At the same time, I was also a witch. So I just, you know, had two hats, so to speak. And I, I had no problem with that. How long were you a priest for? Well, of course, by Catholic theology, I'm still a priest. They believe that when you are ordained to the priesthood, you receive an indelible character on your soul that stays there forever. But I stopped practicing as, as a priest and saying Mass and all that in 1980 when I joined the Mormon Church. Because I believe they had a better priesthood. Okay. But in the meantime, uh, before that, I also went and got a theolo Master's of Theology degree from St. Francis Seminary. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. what, what is the job of a Catholic priest? Well, it basically, it's in many ways, it's similar to, the, to any other clergy person. I mean, you know, they, they counsel people. They're there for funerals, for weddings, and so on. But also, the, the key thing that separates the, the Catholic and the Orthodox and the Anglican priest from the rest of the clergy is that they believe they, they have the authority to act in the name of Christ, literally to be Christ. The doctrine is... Uh, sacerdotus est alter Christus. The priest is another Christ. And they walk up onto that altar, and when they say the words of institution, which is, for this is my body, and, you know, for this is the cup of my blood, you know, blah, 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 they believe they're literally pulling down Jesus Christ out of heaven and putting him into that cookie. And pulling down the blood of Jesus Christ into that chalice, into that wine. And they, the doctrine of that is, is that the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ is contained in that chalice and in that bread. So the idea is, see, think of this way. The very meaning of a priest is someone who offers sacrifice. And the problem with that is, theologically, is that it says in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, is that Yeshua, our high priest, went and offered the sacrifice on Calvary once, for all, and that no longer is there have to be priests that are offering sacrifices every day which can never really even take away sin. So the whole idea is false. But the concept is, is that the priest is there as a mediator, that the, the, the average layman, and that's an interesting term, by the way, because you know what the word layman actually comes from? No. It comes from the Greek word laos, which means stupid people. Oh. <laughs> so, you know, I hate to, I never use that word. Wow. Because we're all priests. Uh, Peter, who was supposedly the first pope, tells us that we are a chosen nation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, and that everyone is in fact a priest of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. But anyhow, so he stands there and he's offering a sacrifice for our sins, supposedly. That's what the Mass does. And the Catholic Church teaches that without the Mass, without attending Mass every Sunday, without receiving the sacrament, especially the sacrament of um, the Eucharist, Holy Communion, and also going to confession at least once a year, you can't make it to heaven. That faith in Christ is not enough. And the sad thing is, is that at the, at the time that this new pope is being enthroned in Rome, is that right now only 25% of Catholics in this country go to church every Sunday. Three-fourths of Catholics are staying at home and, you know, reading the funny papers. So that means the Catholic Church is really in deep, deep doo-doo. But the big difference is, is that all the Bible-believing churches, some of them have lost this over the decades, but were founded on the idea of the priesthood of all believers, and that we 
ourselves can go boldly before the throne of grace. We don't need any priests. We don't need any, you know, pontiffs or anything between us and, and Almighty Yahweh. So that's the big difference. Thank you. What sacraments did you perform while you were a priest? Uh, everyone except, um, I don't think I ever, yeah, I did a wedding, uh, did several weddings. Um, I don't think I ever baptized an infant. I baptized a couple of adults and uh, I did the last rites. I ordained several people to the priesthood. Uh, so I basically did all seven sacraments, I think. Thank you. Did you ever say mass in an ordinary church building? Well, it depends on what you mean by it. I mean, we had a... a normal Catholic church. Well, I wouldn't have been allowed to say Mass in a normal Catholic church. But we had a, a chapel in this very large mansion on the north side of Milwaukee that was this Our Lady of Perpetual Help Friary, Friary, excuse me, and it functioned as both a chapel for Catholics who were dissatisfied with the new Vatican II rites and also as a home for developmentally disabled adult men. And it was a church that basically sat probably 15 or 20 people. So, I mean, I consider that to be a normal church, you know. But it wasn't, it wouldn't have been regarded as a licit Catholic church by the Archdiocese of Milwaukee, no. Okay, thank you. What communication did you get from the Pope? Well, I didn't get any communication from the Pope, but I got a communication who was a right-hand man, who was at that time, oddly enough, the same person in the same position who this new guy that just became Pope Cardinal Ratzinger, he was the head of the Congregation of Doctrine of the Faith. And 25 years ago, I got a letter from Franz Cardinal Schaper, who at that time was in the same position. Because at that time, I was applying to possibly be able to function as a priest within the Roman Catholic Church, not the old Roman, and still, of course, keep my wife. And uh, they basically, basically sent me a letter back telling me that I was an apostate and that my orders were valid, meaning my, my priesthood, my orders were valid but illicit. In other words, <laughs> illegal, because I had not gone through the Holy Papa, you know. Thank you. Mm -hmm.